Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. Today we'll be looking at UN Resolution 43-1, Systemic Racism and Police Brutality, Acting on Dubois' Dream for Dignity Appeal. Currently, the UN Human Rights Council is having its 47th session. And while that might not mean a lot to many people, it's very important because right now they are looking at specific agenda item number nine that's looking at UN Resolution 43 backslash one. This resolution was adopted last year because a great amount of people came together to demand a new way forward. One year ago, as the nation writhed in pain from the death of George Floyd in the pandemic, a handful of human rights defenders mobilized directly impacted family members and civil society movement in the US and around the world to apply moral pressure to the UN Human Rights Council to shine a light on the lack of liberty in the US and stand in solidarity against racism. Over 600 organizations called on the council to mandate an independent inquiry into the killings of violent law enforcement responses to protests. Today, I'm fortunate to be joined by four amazing activists who are working on the ground, but also bring the cause of justice and racial equality and equity to the global stage. Thank you all very much for joining me. Eliza, could you share what happened last year and what's going to be happening next week? on July 12th during agenda item number nine. Yes, thank you, Joshua. I'm so happy to. Um, we are about to see what's gonna happen. But a year ago, like you said, um, really the United Nations wasn't um, really confronted at the volume it was last year with the um, voice of black Americans really crying for um, the US to come into compliance. That's with their national law, stop killing black people. Um, and the African Union really helped put their foot down and insist that something happened. And what happened was the great debate. Um, there was an official special meeting call where, on the record, um, surviving members of families who've lost loved ones to police crime and many human rights uh, violation survivors themselves um, spoke <clears throat> to the body. And... Um, what happened at the end was a little, um, it was unique and it's something to celebrate, um, but resolution 43-1 really was um, just for the first time really deploring this issue and the US's particular role in it. And of course, this is in the context of, you know, the US Human Rights Network together, constant battle uh, to really shift who polices human rights and who, uh, commits torture, which um, in the US we know is the police. So um, by having a resolution that says, you know, we hear by the poor this happening in the States and everywhere. Um, they also insisted that the Office of the High Commissioner look into it and do a report on the steps. So now that we have that report, um, we're looking at what will happen at this meeting of the Human Rights Council. And that's the agenda um, item number nine that you talked about, Joshua. Um, they're going to have to decide, are they going to follow up with this last year's resolution? Um, are they going to say something stronger? Are they going to um, actually name the U.S. as still someone who needs to be held accountable, not the leaders, any accountability on this? Um, and so, you yeah, know, we've been organizing the organizations here. I'll pass the mic to, but the U.S. Human Rights Network is hundreds of organizations um, that's been working on this with many allies globally and nationally. Um, and so, yeah, it's really a moment to keep your eye on. And um, we're hoping certainly that um, the international community intervene and the UN do so as it's meant to do. Um, because clearly the things that are happening to our black people are illegal under international law, but no existing you know, mechanism seems to uh, help correct course. So we're looking at a new one and an intensified one, and hopefully, you know, a spotlight on the U.S. as well as Colombia, Brazil, and places all over the world. And then again, you know, the African Union put their foot down to really ask the U.N. to um, to stand up with them for African descendants all over the world. So. Thank you so much, Eliza. And I was wondering, you know, we know the resolution didn't go as far, didn't ask for that commission of inquiry, but many people were surprised with the tone of the report, do you think the report is stronger and indicates a more serious approach to what's going on? Um, just, just like the actions um, 
a year ago, I, it certainly shows uh, practice. It certainly shows, thanks to the people, um, that the truth it can't really be looked away from. Um, and so, you know, certainly um, we're looking for something stronger and um, with a clear course for holding our country accountable for international law. But Thank you so much. Krista, I know you're focusing a lot on the issue of police brutality. Could you highlight some of the challenges that people are facing in Chicago and how using the international instruments has been a powerful tool for transformation in your experience? Um, sure. Uh, in Chicago in particular, you know, we've been, well, we started in Chicago, I guess, during the torture um, the John Burge torture, but that John Burge torture wasn't just John Burge. Um, there was torture going on across the many different um, area precinct uh, jails and wherever police were taking them because we have home and square as well, as well, which was kind of a black op site. Um, so I would say that it probably started uh, with Stan writing his report in like 2007, I think it was. He wrote the report somewhere around there. Could have been 201. Um, and uh, then it picked up with Rakia because uh, Rakia Boyd, who was shot while she was walking to the store with her friends, um, shot in her head while she was walking to the store with her friends. Um, and I think that kind of gelled it for everyone. Um, and then um, we had Damo Franklin, um, Dominique Franklin, who was uh, killed after he was tased because he, like, I think he stole a bottle of uh, liquor out of Walgreens and they tased him and he um, uh, hit a pole and then had to be taken off of life support or passed away. Um, and then finally, Laquan McDonald, which was uh, 16 shots, right? So um, all of those together, um, and it goes back to LaTanya Haggerty from 1999, right? Um, all of those together just gelled. Um, and we, in the... Um, in our history of having gone to the UN in 2000, we just kept using that as a uh, option. Um, but I wanna make it clear that we did try locally before we went to the UN. And that's important because when we went to the UN, um, I remember one of the commissioners for CERT um, specifically asked, did you go to your state? Did you go to your city? And we were like, yes, we went to our city. We went to, uh, at the time, Anita Alvarez. Um, we went to uh, the Department of Justice here in the city, the federal courts here in the city, not the federal courts, but the federal oversight here in the city. Um, we went to Lisa Madigan, you know, um, and, you know, wrote these letters telling them that this was something that they needed to address. Um, we wrote shadow reports. Uh, Women's All Points Bulletin wrote American Police Crimes Against African Women and Women of Color. Um, we had written uh, with the Chicago Alliance a collaborative report on um, the killings, the extrajudicial killings of African people uh, by the police. It's a longer title, but it's it's out there on the UShern's website. Uh, and uh, it, it just all gelled together to be able to go to the different U.S. reviews um, and bring these cases, which, you know, it was, it was a question of why the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice had not uh, engaged in um, at an investigation of the police before uh, Laquan. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so when we were speaking to them, when they do the reviews and they invite you out to Washington and, and to talk to them, um, we were asking, you know, why they weren't doing that. You know, so at the point where we're using international mechanisms, right, um, it, we had already talked to them. Right. So it just solidified it. 
you know, I remember that me and Martinez were talking to Lisa Madigan and Lisa Madigan is the person after the DOJ came in. We did get the investigation and I can point directly to the work that was done by We Charge Genocide, um, Women's All Points Bulletin. Um, we even had uh, Mike Brown's mom, uh, Leslie, was there. Uh, all of this work came together. Uh, to bring us to this point, you know, but I really believe that it started, you know, internationally, all of this started internationally and just built to this. So, you know, Chicago, we still have our issues. They just uh, shot and killed Adam Toledo, who was 13 years old with his hands up. They chased down, mm -hmm, hands up, don't shoot. I, I told everyone that this is universal for, you know, don't shoot me. Right. Everybody knows that. <laughs> right. You know, everybody across all countries. And this is the way he was when he was shot. And the argument of uh, um, split second decisions, which they like making that argument, they go through training called shoot, don't shoot. That actually trains them to make the right split second decision. And they continue to use the excuse of the wrong split second decision, knowing that they're trained to make the right one, right? Um, and we're gullible enough to listen to them. So that's another thing, changing the narratives. Those narratives are changing at the international level. And so we're really happy about, you know, uh, the movement that started with uh, well, I won't say that it started with George Floyd, but the the movement that uh, just how could the the word for the twenty eight million people going <laughs> onto the street, right? Crystallize um, the consciousness. Th there you go. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, and made people get out of their houses. And I'm sure COVID had something to do with that. A lot of people didn't want to be locked up anymore and said, well, this is a good reason to come out the house and put your life on the line, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when that when that occurred, you know, it, it like you said, it, it really woke up the world. George woke up the world. If it hadn't been woke up by uh, Mike Brown, if it hadn't been woke up, by Laquan McDonald, if it hadn't been woke up by Sandra Bland, if it hadn't been woke up by Rakia Boyd, if it hadn't been woke up by La Tanya Haggerty it, or Oscar Grant, it was awakened by George Floyd. And so sad how many more names we have to bring up and new names added even since George Floyd. There's one aspect, uh, I want to move on to other speakers, but you did a lot of great research as well about police violence towards women. Maybe you want to touch on that very briefly, and then we'll move on to Monica. But I wanted to allow you to share that because I know that's an important aspect as well of your work. Yeah, well, a lot of people, uh, the focus is on shootings, right? Uh, and so, and, and being shot dead. Um, there's a lot of focus that's not on survivors. So if you can imagine that they've killed about 35,000 people since um, the early 2000s. The police in America have killed about 35,000 people since the early 2000s. And to give you an idea, the death penalty is about 1,000 people in that same period of time. So, you know, they are extrajudicial killers, right? And they're way better at killing people than, than the actual quote unquote state is, you know, the U.S. Uh, government. Um, but with that being said, even though they, they're representing the U.S. government, um, but with that being said, women, we're not just shot. We're raped. We're killed in car chases when we're the innocents. We're uh, beaten in our homes. The domestic violence police are number one in domestic violence. Um, so when you put all of those things together, rape, domestic violence, shootings, beatings, um, uh, they've even, seri they're serial killers uh, uh, and serial rapists, right? Um, so when you put all those together, I think that women are the number one um, uh, entity that's affected by the police. Um, and that's, we're, we were trying to bring visibility to that in 
worked since 2009. Um, and Andrea Ritchie had been out there since 2007. And it picked up with Say Her Name and Speak My Sister's Names and all of the work that we've been doing. But it's just important to realize that it isn't police violence isn't about shooting. Sandra Bland died in prison, right, or in jail, right? So we have what we call extraordinary occurrences that happen when you're arrested unfairly, right? Um, and put in jail and the things that happen because of confinement. Uh, and you have to just think of police violence as this really large um, set, right? And then you take the little subsets, right? Um, and that will give you an idea of how violent they really are. And they're very, very violent on all different levels. But Women are usually, uh, even women will write articles and not mention women who have been killed in police custody, you know. So, you know, it's something that you have to, we have to put in our minds and constantly uh, be uh, vigilant in making sure that you speak to the violence against women. Thank you, Krista. And the report that was just released introduces a new four-point agenda to end systemic racism and the human rights violations by law enforcement. The first one is to step up, stop denying and start dismantling. The second, pursue justice, ending impunity and building trust. The third, listen up, people of African descent must be heard. And fourth, redress, confronting past legacies, taking special measures and delivering repertory justice. Monica, do these four steps at do they sound like a strong beginning, or what else should be taken into account? Well, I like I always like to start off in saying, as an African American descendant, if I am not free, if I am not safe, if I don't have a fair chance, just like any other citizen, my counterparts, um, the problem is there. Everything else about me, my identity, my class, my age, uh, my ableism or disabilities, all of that is collateral consequences. I think that it is so important that we focus on uh, ending racial oppression, racial violence at a state level, and that impact us on so many different levels. I remember being in my senior year of high school and being kicked out of high school on the first day because I transitioned. And there was no recourse for me. There was no resources available for me. And at that time, I was, I was put out into the streets. And at that time, I encountered police encounter after encounter because I was walking as trans. And as a result of walking as trans, a lot of times I had to negotiate my body with police for my freedom. I was forced into sex acts to be free. Um, only to be locked up the following week. Um, and then I was forced to be incarcerated in a man's penitentiary, in a man's holding facility. Um, and, and I was forced to violence during that time. And one of the greatest violence that I remember being forced into was solitary confinement. I was forced into solitary confinement for six months. And at that time, it was the greatest challenge on my psyche because I had never been forced and I had never been in solitary confinement. And so for me, that was very, that was extreme punishment. Um, not to mention that I was being harassed on a daily basis. I was denied um, health care. Um, my Eighth Amendment was violated because I was trans. And it still happens today. I still receive numerous uh, requests for help from different women around the world in the United States asking for help to receive their basic health care um, for whatever their health conditions may be. Um, but a lot of times those requests are for gender affirming health care. A lot of times people are saying that they're at their breaking point because they are forced into solitary confinement. They feel as though they have been lost into solitary confinement. And it, I find it ironic that we're still fighting to end solitary confinement as a means of housing um, people that are considered to be part of a vulnerable population. Um, and that could be anyone from the LGBT community, someone who is disabled, 
automatically being placed in solitary confinement for the duration of their incarceration. And I do understand that I cannot ever compare that to a lot of my political prisoners, brothers and sisters who have been in prison for their political stand against the treatment against Black and Brown people in America. But however, we know what it is like. And upon at that time, we are not able to focus on rehabilitating ourselves. We are let out back into society, the same society that discriminates against us on the basis of our race first, and then second, our gender, third, our age and ability. And so it the list goes on and on and on. And I always like to say, respect me as a Black person. I want to be free as a Black person because if I'm free as a Black person, everything else is obsolete because it's really personal. And I have yet to witness a time that I have not had to confront and address um, systemic racial oppression in my everyday life. And I, I am happy at, to see that the conversations are where they are. Um, I also second Krista. I was out there for um, Rakia Boyd's advocacy. We wanted justice for Rakia and we did not get. Um, Laquan McDonald, Laquan McDonald, we, we wanted that justice and we did not get. And then the list just continued to go on and on and on. And I like to say that George Floyd revived the people to remember that this is still active. This is still happening. And today we have it on camera and we cannot let this go by. And then following that, it was Breonna Taylor. And something that is hugely important for us to address is no knock warrants. There are so many people of people from our communities are dying. They're having their lives traumatized, disheveled, disrupted, broken due to a no-knock warrant. And a lot of times that no-knock warrant is not even for the house whose door they kicked in. And so I like to always say that as an African-American descendant, it is important that I know what freedom is and look like, feels like, tastes like as a Black person before I can focus on what freedom looks like as a transgender person, as a, as a, a, a senior citizen, or anything else. It is my Blackness that you see first. And it is my Blackness that, act, that prompts you to act in a certain way against me or in support of me. And so I like to see people focus more on race and all the different identity politics. I like for us to kind of contain them in, in other ways, but let's stick to the issue at hand and for me, the issue at hand is always race. It is Thank race. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. It really does bring us to our, our final speaker, Jihad, because, I mean, I know he was an amazing leader in the Black Panther movement and also a political prisoner of conscience. And that's something that has really been ignored. When we're talking about systemic racism, it's because the system's doing exactly what it was set up to actually do. Mm. And I know when we came to the UN in 2000 with the different UPR reviews with the CERD and with the CAT. Jihad, your voice was really listened to in Geneva because you brought up the points that everyone you need to know. You talked about the hypocrisy of democracy in the US. I thought one of the best quotes I remember, I'll always remember it is, you know, instead of putting that microscope on those other countries that need to work on their human rights, that the US needs to really hold up that mirror and look deep into its soul. And so I just wanted to. See, what do you think of this latest report and if you think it is a step in the right direction? And thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, Joshua and everybody else, I appreciate you very much. I can, cannot be more profound with that. So uh, just adding to it really briefly is that um, I think it's a step in the right direction to always uh, have trajectories that reach international and to highlight our issues as human rights issues on the human on the national international stage is very important. Uh, I think what's oftentimes is remiss a lot is that um, as our high, uh, Malik Tabaz said, that we have to really, we are our own liberators. And when I came back from Geneva each time, I was kind of, it was kind of demoralizing to see that we didn't have the infrastructure to be able to capitalize off of all the wonderful work that's being done internationally. 
So um, I think that that's something that that we have to build up our, in, our national stature, our national organizing, our strength to make a demand. To make to be able to make a demand, we have to have people power and people on the same page and working together, building viable, real, co sincere coalitions amongst each other. We don't have that, sisters and brothers. This is 2021. And when I'm 66 years old, and when I was 16, I'd be doggone if I wasn't dealing with the exact same issues. And as the saying goes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. We're falling off. We're not, we're not doing the organizing on the ground. So the ask that the ask. Okay, that's on the table, has to remain on the table, but how do we effectuate it into a demand? The only way we can do that is to organize better and to make sure that all the wonderful work that we're doing through the United States Human Rights Network, that Joshua Cooper is doing, that all of us are doing in our own capacities um, and listening to your wonderful, powerful voices, you know, what's remiss? And we won't make it that far. If we do not muster the strength of organizing the mobilization within our own communities to effectuate a demand, otherwise we'll be asking the slave master to tell the overseer to treat us better. And that's my point. That's it. And the Black Panther Party was into the community to do these. I know it's so retro to say that. And, it's, and this is not to overlook the many powerful organizations that are in the community. I'm just saying, and you know what the landscape looks like. You know what the landscape looks like. You know how we treat our own, and we have to come out of our silos a little more and, and, and really work together to, to bring about this change. Other than that, Joshua, I think that we're doing an admirable job on the international level and bringing people into the picture, hearing the voices of those that are directly impacted. That's powerful. I'm listening to Monica. I'm listening to everybody that was on earlier in the, to the um, UN presentations today. And it's powerful. And, 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 but, you know, as I told the African Union, if you don't know that these issues already exist, you may not know the sordid detail, but you know they exist. If you didn't, you're, you've been under a rock and you should not be in that position that you are in. And I say that very directly. People are dying. So I'm going to talk directly to the issue and not sugarcoat it, you know, and it's, it's, the United States is very arrogant. It doesn't care what we're saying. And we all know that. That's why our demands has to be backed by people, unified people power so that when we hit that international stage, those looking and those listening know that we, are, or we represent an organized mass of people, not a just a fragmented mass that we are in this present state. So I don't want to bring a negativity to the table, but it is real talk because we will be on the same page and, and every year doing the same thing with these stellar presentations and the sisters and brothers marching overseas to make it real. And people overseas will look at you and they say, well, you haven't done your homework in your own community. And that's it, you know, so I'm, I'm with you all the way, everybody. Um, and we just have to stand united and make that work in a broader sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jihad. And, and that's an excellent point that we do have to shatter those silos and create the campaign and the communications together. And it will be an opportunity next Monday for the world to really, in a way, put the U.S. in the court of public opinion, the world court of public opinion. But then there are more opportunities with the U.N. Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. That review will be coming up. Uh, there's also the anniversary of the Durban Declaration of Program of Action. We definitely need a national action plan. And I know we only have like a minute left. Eliza, if you'd want to say maybe some of the next steps after the uh, discussion on Monday at the Human Rights Council, what you see the next steps could be briefly. Oh, yes. I'd just um, love to invite any of your mm. watchers and listeners to keep in touch with uh, the U.S. Human Rights Network um, so you don't miss a beat. It's info at ushrnetwork.org, info at ushrnetwork.org. Um, you can get in touch with the coordinating center there. We're based in Atlanta and we're you know, nationwide and, and globally to connect people to keep people at the center of the human rights solutions that are so urgent. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And we thank all of our guests for appearing and more importantly for all their advocacy from the grassroots on the ground up to the global. And we look forward to continue to changing the conditions daily and making sure that human rights are realized for all. Mahalo and thank you all, and look forward to our next event.
of course, what will happen on Monday at the Human Rights Council. Aloha. <laughs>